4101, 5101. This is lecture number 11. Thank you very much for showing up. I appreciate the time. So today, we're going to look at the embedded system of the day. And I'll show this side of it and see what you guys think. You guys in the sense of the Chicago and news guys. Seems like it's been rubbing some. What does that look like? A bullet? <laughs> By the way, this is uh, this is a large paper clip right next to it. So it's not that small. There's my finger, I need to cut my nails, yes I know. You might think, wow, look at how Okay, any uh, any idea yet? I'll do one end of it. Um, it's a hard drive. SD card. Say that again. It's a hard drive. Alright. No, it is a hard drive. It is a hard drive. I think this is a 16 gig hard drive that fits into the SD card slot of different electronics. This is probably how old? Ten years old? Sixteen mm -hmm. I'm sorry, sixteen May. Oh, Did I say yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. yeah. Sixteen May. Yeah, no, right? I was like, <laughs> yeah, ten years old, sixteen May. I don't know exactly what it is. This was given to me by uh, Bill Haybrook, who used to work for the company Hitachi, which used to be his division used to be IBM. Small company, you might have heard of it. But if we look again, what is this? What does this have? By the way, usually when you buy this, that's not open like that, right? Um, he put a piece of plastic over it just so you can see what it looks like. Look at this, just a standard, uh, standard hard drive. You've got a platter. You have a uh, hard drive read arm that will go across. And then, of course, associated with this, you have the electronics. By the way, this is just the back side. It's probably the motor for this. We have several communications chips associated with the uh, um, uh, sending and transmission of data. A uh, bunch of passives around the edge. Notice that's all surface mount. There probably, oh, there are a couple of screws there. So something has to be done by hand. So. Uh, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five screws, extremely small. Um, they're probably not uh, anything that is expected to be taken out. And let's see, do we have anything on here? No, here's where the screws actually screw into on this. So, uh, again, I've been showing a lot of these embedded systems that are relatively small. Why is that? Because they're getting smaller and everything's getting smaller, right? What else? It's kind of hard to bring a car inside here, right? However, I am going to try and get a, uh, uh, one of the uh, embedded uh, computer modules just to bring it in. Do you have one? I have an ECU. Can, I, can you bring it in? I'm assuming it's something that you don't really need anymore. Because if it's out, chances are not good that it's working, right? It's just from an automatic transmission. Okay. If you could bring it in, that would be great. And we could show that. You'll get a trip to the prize closet. I think you've already been ready, right? Oh, three. All right, man. We can't give you anything. You just bring it in for fun. All right. So this is uh, another example of an embedded system. Obviously, uh, the larger chip here is going to be some sort of microcontroller. Do you think this has code on it that can be updated? Or is it manufactured with code that's always the same? Hmm. What do you think? I would assume that you can update it and rewrite it. You think that you can update the code on that specific little device, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So, 
I'm going to tell, I'm, I'm actually going to deviate a little bit uh, from lecture number, or uh, book chapter number six. I'm going to go into a little bit of detail since this is a good question. This might be a good test question too, you never know. So I showed that, and that will be in the slides as well. But one thing to think about is, very often, you have an embedded system, and this is your microcontroller, which has some onboard flash, but then it has some offboard ROM or RAM. By the way, this could be RAM, this could also be, you no, know, I'll call it RAM, but it could also have some onboard flash as well, or offboard flash. So imagine this. Imagine you have your microcontroller, and this is your uh, SD card interface. And you're getting data from something, whether it be a PC or your electronic, right? You have this flash, and this flash used to boot system, and it's a very small piece of flash that's on the microcontroller. And what that will do is that will always be there and never ever change. And all it does is it says, I'm going to boot up, and if I have a special signal coming in from this side, the special signal will be new code. I'll bring in the new code. Otherwise, I'll just start running but you actually run code from flash. And if it's time to change the code, it will get that signal, and it will use the code inside of this flash that could never change and never be changed to actually take the data, or take the new code, and put it into that flash. And by the way, I put RAM on here because RAM is most likely used for temporary data storage when you're writing to the disk and reading from the disk. Now how often do you change that flash over there? Not that often. Maybe when you get a new driver. How often do you get new drivers for your hardware devices? Firmware drivers, well, it's drivers for the PC, which often have with it a, uh, a change for the, uh, the firmware on the actual device. And that's what this is. This is firmware. This up here is often called the bootloader. Anybody familiar with the, uh, the model of PCs? When you buy a PC, it first starts up, right? What's running when you first start up? It's the BIOS, right? The basic input-output system. And the first thing it does is it does a basic check of all the hardware. And if everything looks good, then it'll go to a specific location on the hard drive and start whatever running whatever is there. It looks at the boot sector, starts bringing in the, uh, the respective operating system files, does a more extensive uh, test. That's why the BIOS is the basic input-output system. And then once it gets the operating system going, it's not really referred to anymore at all. In the old days, in the old days, the uh, the BIOS was a uh, a chip that had a little window in it. I think I mentioned this in the previous class, right? 
And uh, you could reprogram the chip by popping it out of your PC and putting it in a, a special eraser that used ultraviolet light to erase it. Then you programmed it uh, with the new data. And then you pop it back into your machine because it was a dip type of uh, chip. That was fun days. Ooh. Now everything is done with flash, right? That's still done on old PCUs. Yeah, it's still done on on a lot of different devices that uh, that have old architectures that they don't want to change. Things like uh, uh, military uh, planes don't have the latest up-to-date stuff because they want a hardware and software that's been tested. I mean, there's, there's an old uh, story about how um, some company was working on uh, airplane guidance systems and they found a particular bug that when an airplane crossed the equator, some software was not correct and the plane would flip upside down because it couldn't handle North Hemisphere versus South Hemisphere. I don't know if that's true. I should ask. I should ask, mis ask MythBusters if that's true, right? All right. Any other questions about the embedded systems app of the day? Just like MythBusters, if you want me to cover anything else, uh, feel free to uh, tell me you're going to bring something in and uh, and let me know, and I'll uh, I'll need a day or so to look at it. And figure out some of the chips on it, things like that. So if you could bring that to me earlier than later, that'd be better. I'll bring it now. I'm going to hand it for extra credit. Extra credit, yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, let's look at chapter six. Chapter six now is talking about A to D, converting between the analog and digital domains. Now, we got a flavor of that in our first chapter where we were, or our second chapter, I should say, when we're looking at conversions and why you would want to do that. So again, let's look at, back at some of the main concepts associated with that. And it's really easy to imagine that we have the following inputs to our A to D conversion unit, or our ADC. In our basic ADC, you will have your VN. In other words, whatever you are trying to measure. And that's your analog input, right? What is your analog input based on? It's based on, and it should be between, your V reference positive and your V reference negative. In other words, in most A to D conversion units, you're actually able to identify your entire range based on a positive and a, or a high and a low voltage. All right? So you could have something like zero volts here, which is pretty much what we've done previously. Or you can say this is negative five volts. And then you can call this positive five volts. And so if you have positive 5 to negative 5, that's obviously a range of 10. 10 volts that your VN, your analog input, should be between. This, of course, should not be changing while you're doing your measurements. The number of bits you have out there, of course, will be the resolution. So your digital output... can be however many bits you want to associate it with it. Most A to D conversions are not worthwhile unless they are at least 8 bits. So that's the smallest I've ever seen anywhere. And our device will actually go to 12 bits. And if you buy specialty A to D converters, this is a special chip that uh, you could put into your system. So specialty could be uh, up to 18 bits. Uh, 
the way, up to is uh, two different words. This thing is just funky. I don't know what's going on with that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to use our system, and we're going to gather all over the place in our system A to D data. So the general process that you want to do is you'll want to have the hardware. Well, first of all, the setup. Make sure that v, uh, VREF positive and VREF negative are set. Or wired, I should say. You will want to identify the ports for input, and then you'll need to wire those, right? I'm talking about the hardware setup. First of all, I should... You should also ensure the signal flows. What does that mean? What would cause a signal not to be able to flow? Pull up resistor. All right, no pull off or pull down ours. So what does a typical microcontroller give you? Typically, a microcontroller will provide some sort of home circuitry. Think about this. If I'm walking along, and you want to find out where I am at any instant in time, what do you typically do? In the analog sense. You want to see where I am right now. What would the way to verify this is where I am? Other than nail my foot to the ground. Take a snapshot, right? And that's all a whole circuit does. Is it says, at this point in time, poof. That's what the voltage is. Because remember, measuring an A to D converter measures an analog voltage and then converts it to the digital world. So, old circuitry takes a snapshot. Well, actually, even before that, it will identify the specific port. And we're going to see later that you can have all sorts of different lines go into your, uh, into your microcontroller. You have multiple analog lines. You can measure eight. You know, there's one of the ports. Each of the bits can be an A to D input, which is pretty neat because sometimes you have a lot of analog lines to measure. And then you can say, I want to take a picture of that one, then 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 that one. Then that one. You do eight, and then you can start all over again. And in fact, you can even write code that says, do all eight, start over, do all eight again, start all over, do all eight again. So then the whole circuitry will take that snapshot, and then there is a analog to digital conversion. Which will give you a, a digital digital representation of your analog 
voltage. And that's all we're going to work with. We're going to write some code that will be able to do that for you. Sound easy? Ah, simple. You bet. By the way, uh, as, as a little picture, here's uh, a sample, here's an example of your sample and hold circuit. Just every so often it will pull the switch down and uh, it'll take a hold capacitor and give it a charge. The switch goes away and then the uh, capacitor holds the voltage which will be uh, identified in your, hand, uh, in your A to D converter. So did I go over the example in, uh, in a previous class? I'm trying to remember. From this, did I do it in this class where I said uh, uh, choose a number and see if you can get to it? I think I, I've done this nearly in all my classes. I probably did it in robotics, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so you keep your mouth shut. So let's take a, a good example of this. Uh, I need uh, I need a volunteer to uh, play a game with me. Who wants to play a game? Who who hasn't visited the uh, um, uh, prize closet yet. Come on, somebody. It's good. It's really easy. It's a guessing game. All right, the peanut gallery back there. Have you had a trip yet? All right, you're you're the winner. All right. So my guessing game. I have a number. between 0 and 100 and I'm going to ask you to uh, uh, guess the number in the least amount of guesses. Uh, oh, hold on, let me, let me think of a number. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to write it at the bottom of the page. Can you see this? Good. Alright, what's your first guess? Oh, and I'll tell you if, when you give me a guess, I'll tell you if it's higher or lower. I'm sorry, 50. Oh, 50, all right. So, guess one. All right, it is lower. I guess 25. Ooh, you know the game. Lower. I guess 15. Ooh. Didn't cut it in half, but we'll see. Lower. You want to you re-guess again? Huh? You want to read this other than 15? I mean, sure, 12.5. Uh, okay, it's got to be a whole number. <laughs> 12. Still lower. 6. 6, good choice. Lower. 3. It's lower. 1. It's higher. <laughs> Oops. Yes, seven, yeah, my, my two, ding, 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 you are the winner. In case you're wondering if I really was telling you the, the trick of the matter, the number that I wrote down was two. So, but you knew the game, so you know how to do it. So what did we do? This is what's called successive approximation. So let me guess, it's halfway in the middle. Is that it? No, try again. Is that it? No, try again. But at least you know what it is. And this is what our A to D conversion will do in our, uh, in our hardware. So uh, an example of this, higher or lower sounds like what type of a number? You have a choice between one or the other. What does that sound like? <coughs> Binary, right? And so and the whole idea, uh, you just say, is it higher or lower? And let's say this is your input. So you split the difference. Higher or lower? Well, it is higher. higher. So, something's not right here. <laughs> oh, yes, 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 there it is. Um, higher or lower? Higher. All right, is it higher or lower? So it's going to be between here. You know what, I've got to work on that in the book. That's not the right side. Uh, you would say higher. So then you would go up here. Lower, 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 lower. You know what? I don't like the way that is. I'm going to have to fix this picture. All right, so <laughs> I think this picture needs to be worked on. I apologize. Uh, I'll work on that. So the whole idea is that um, 
I, I think your example is a lot better. You know, you say higher, lower, higher, lower, and it looks a lot more close. To what you, you know, so. All right, sound easy enough? So along that lines, then we have to take a look at what time is going to be associated with our conversion. So the time of our confer conversion is really associated with several aspects. One is some sort of delay time that you're going to start with, right? So how much time for our conversion? You have to uh, you have to worry about the startup time. So you'll have some sort of delay time, right? You'll have sampling. By the way, this is T of D. This is T of SPL. At sampling, you'll have T of successive conversion. Man, I spelled this so wrong up here, nobody said anything. <laughs> I was just writing it down. Hey, look at that. Two balls. <laughs> Conversion. There we go. You are all so very polite, not wanting to correct me in public. I can assure you, I can take it, okay? And then the actual uh, A to D conversion time is uh, going to be TD plus T sampling plus T successive approximation. Now which do you think is going to take the most of all of this? Conversion. So the sample time... <laughs> something wrong? Hey, in the end, when the notes come out, they're all correct, aren't they? <laughs> Even without your help. But do other, uh, other faculty members that you have classes from, do they take it personally if you correct them? Do I really? The Conversion. Oh. Conversion. No, it's not spelled wrong. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the unfortunate thing is that uh, I have it on record unless I edit that out, right? All right, the one that takes the most time, uh, let's take a vote. Who votes uh, the delay time? Who votes the sampling time? Who votes the successive conversion time? Who doesn't vote for anything and wants to be right anyhow? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I thought. The answer is most. I vote for the bottom one. I'm the right. Yeah, yeah, which one takes the most time? This one, obviously, right? Because it's the summation of all the others. I want my gift from the prize closet back, by the way, so. But so now I need to one. So that's true most of the time, right? Nearly all the time, unless you successive approximate exactly the number that your first your first shot. Because depending on your hardware depends on how many times you have to go through and what your range is, right? So we'll take a look at that a little bit later. We'll look at what your uh, what your beautiful range could be for all of that. I do believe that we have discussed. Uh, um, some other topic as well. 
Some other topic being what the value of a conversion is, right? And uh, do you remember what it's based on? What is the digital value you get out from your A to D conversion? It's N, right? And it's going to be based on... Well, this is where I get really interesting. I'm going to round. I think I used this before, right? I said, give me the integer. You can put that at the beginning or the end. doesn't matter. Just say, give me the integer of this. So the round, we add one half, right? Because as you well know, if you have an integer value, which is what n is going to be, you need to make sure that you round and you don't have any decimal points like we do in math. But the main thing we're reading is what? V in, right? What is our voltage we're reading in? And of course, it's going to depend on our V reference positive. By the way, sometimes people write this as V plus ref. That's the same as V ref plus. It'll show up two different ways depending on the data book you open up. And then it also depends on how many bits you allow for your A to D conversion, right? So N equals uh, bits in our ADC unit, or A to D conversion unit. And of course, we all know what VN is, right? Is our input, uh, input analog signal. Oh, by the way, we have to say minus 1 over here. Mm -hmm. But you notice I have a little bit of extra space here, right? So what have I not included yet? So we have to keep in mind that if we have a really big range of voltages associated with our A to D converter, which very often does if you're reading stuff in the uh, analog world, analog world is really not, oh, I'm zero volts to five volts, and I'm just happy working this way. Very often, it could be a wide range. Look at AC voltage, right? 60 hertz. Is it uh, 110 to minus 110? in the one direction or the other, right? Okay, so sometimes your device will have a negative voltage compared to your, uh, your ground. We're not going to get into that. But, as I said, V ref plus and V ref minus. So this is the highest voltage. V in could be and the lowest voltage V in could be. And since we've gone over this in great detail, I don't need to go into this. But you know what? I do want to have you work on one. So, just for grins, turn to your neighbor and say, let's say I have uh, V in equals Five volts. V ref plus equal to ten volts. V ref minus equal to minus ten volts. And my uh, my number of bits is equal to twelve. What is n?
Because remember, inside of our machine, even though we have 12 
or even though we have in this case eight inputs, eight different analog lines that come in, you can decide to work with only one at a time because you have only one A to D conversion unit. It's really expensive and it takes up a lot of space so you can only really put one in there. Later on we'll see there's another one that exists for a smaller, uh, smaller conversion rate. So in this case we'll decide, okay, let us do a, uh, an analysis of this and what are our inputs? Well, here we go. We have our VREF high and our VREF low, right? That will let us know what our highest and lowest reference is, our analog signal, once we get, let's say it's from uh, port zero, it will actually go through our sample and hold circuit, and then our sample and hold circuit will keep the, uh, the analog signal to what it is, and it will go through a comparator. Our comparator will then identify is it greater than or less than, and so the control circuit here, which controls everything else, will determine if it's higher or lower. Eventually, it will fill up this 12-bit D to A with our successive approximation register, which will then put whatever the value is in one of the eight data registers here. So this is a data register. And it will give a successive approximation just like we saw earlier in the uh, in the picture, similar here, which I've got to fix. So these are all the data registers that we'll be able to hold. In the first case, this conversion from AN0 will be sold or saved in ADDR0. And these are all the control registers that you will need to set to be able to do your uh, A to D conversion and then later read the information back later. Now one thing I should also mention too is that there are a couple of other signals here that are important, at least for us right here. And we're going to go into interrupts a little bit later, but wouldn't it be nice to know when the A to D conversion is done? Because you might not have to go through all 12 steps you might hit upon the number almost immediately. So in that case, you can actually respond back to maybe the main running program with something called an interrupt. You remember our concept of interrupts. I, I said this earlier in class, right? Don't you remember the uh, uh, direct memory access example I did? Where every so often somebody tapped me on the shoulder and say, I need this, I need this. Well, it's the same idea. The, you can set the A to D conversion up, and it could do whatever it wants, and when it's done, then it could tell the main microcontroller, hey, it's done, you can read the data now. And so that's the, uh, that's the objective of the interrupt signal. We're going to go into interrupt, interrupt devices and uh, interrupt service routines in a lot more detail in chapter 8 or 9, I can't remember which one. Man, there's a whole bunch of stuff here that I wanted to do a really good example of, but uh, I didn't get a chance to actually give a fairly decent program for this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, right now we'll hold off on continuing on this section, and I will revisit it in our next class, which is a week from Wednesday. So, thank you very much. You can turn that off.